So before we get too far in, I, it's always helpful to kind of know who's in the audience. So does everyone here teach IVC or potentially teach IVC courses? Okay, so one of the reasons that we um, we're talking about this is because we're both in our third year and we started out at USU teaching in IVC courses. And I had taught blended courses before, but I had never taught in IVC. So we both, I think, had a pretty uh, hefty learning curve in learning how to teach IVC, which may be the case with some of you. Um, and I think it's also relevant that we are both teacher education, teacher educators. So um, that has something to do with the way we teach is, is kind of unique in some of our courses. So some of the examples that we may use are from teacher education, but we'll try and kind of gather um, and help you think about how some of these might apply to your uh, content areas. One of the things that we know from, the from looking at educational research is how important dialogue and talk is in learning. So, I, you know, I teach future English secondary high school and middle school English teachers. So one of my favorite things to tell my students is reading and writing float on a sea of talk. That's one of our big sayings in secondary English education. And I think it doesn't apply just in English or in education. I think it applies in all of our fields. Learning floats on a sea of talk. And we know that it is a very powerful component of pedagogy and it engages students actively in higher order thinking when we give them opportunities to talk to one another. Um, so another bit of the research on that what, that talks about dialogue is that um, it allows all of the voices to be heard. Sometimes that is challenging in, a, in a, a university environment, in some cases where you have really large classes and you, you can't talk to all of those students. So trying to figure out ways for them to talk to each other is one of the ways that we um, that we teach. So uh, for us, we model the types of uh, classroom environments that we want our students to create in their classroom. So when our students are going to go teach face to face, but we're teaching them in IVC. So, so that's one of our challenges is trying to figure out ways to model the types of uh, methods and, and communities of practice that we want our students to be able to create um, while doing it in this IVC environment. So uh, some of our students are alone which maybe in your cases they might be the only person there so the only people they talk to are, are here is you unless you provide them opportunities um, to share with the whole class. Um, and discussion also is a part of our, of, of our methods of teaching that uh, we know that we learn a lot by discussing things with others. Some, some content, um, some is content related, some is um, more person, personal feelings towards things and things like that. That, that discussion piece is really an important part of learning. All right, so as, we, as any of you who have taught IVC before know, there are some big challenges to teaching in this format. It's great because it allows us to bring classes to students who it otherwise wouldn't be available to. It allows us to make the state our classroom, as our, our new provost was saying at lunch today. But this format does have challenges. We know from research that um, students tend to be off task if they are away from the instructor. If they're at a remote site without the instructor there in the room with them, they're more likely to be off task. We also know from research that students report that they are more likely to ask questions and they feel that they learn more in face-to-face -face classes versus an IVC class. We also know that the less the professor lectures and the more the students get the opportunity to share their thoughts and think through their learning with their classmates, the higher they rate the course uh, at the end of the semester. And one of the things that this relates with, with me um, is that we are actually uh, located out in Uinta Basin. And so even though we attend faculty meetings, a lot of times we attend faculty meetings uh, on IVC and I don't know if you've ever had to attend meetings that way but it's very easy to like get on your computer and you know be multitasking while you're supposed to be listening to something so um, that's kind of the situation that our students are in it's a very easy if we're if what we're doing is not engaging them in some way for them to, to get off task very easily and we can't monitor them in a face-to-face -face classroom you might be able to walk around and 
you know, kind of make sure everybody's paying attention. Or in a secondary class, you could go, or elementary, you can go, you know, tap on someone's shoulder. Or, you know, I mean, there's things you can do in face-to-face -face that you can't do when you're in an IVC. And it's, so it's very easy for our students to get off task. So that's something to think about. All right, so uh, in one way that we have addressed these challenges in our IVC courses is we've used small group video conferencing in our IVC classes. So we have broken students off into small groups, just like you would do in a face-to-face -face class, but they'll do it using a, tool, a, a video conferencing tool that we have so that they can have a small group video conference. Uh, as well. So the tools that we have used, um, we started with Akano when that was part of uh, what the tools we had available to us in Canvas. And then um, Cisco bought Akano and it became CMA. And um, then CMA got updated and it stopped working. So the College of Education has a license for Zoom. And Zoom is, a, is the video conferencing tool that we've been using in our classes. So one of the things that we like about using this tool is uh, it has what um, Zoom calls breakout rooms. So if I have students and I want to put them into breakout rooms, I just, tell the, I just tell Zoom I need this many breakout rooms and I want this many people in each room. And then Zoom will either put people in there randomly or you can, you can put people into certain groups if you, for some reason, want certain groups to work together. For example, in one of my classes, um, I teach literacy, integrating literacy across the curriculum. Uh, it's our content area literacy course. And for part of what we do in class, I want people who teach in, in the same or similar disciplines to get together to talk about literacy in their discipline so that then they can share that out to the whole class. So I might want my math people in a group and my science people in a group and my social studies people in a group. And so this tool allows me to do that uh, as I need to. And it also allows you as the instructor to pop in on the groups. So as many breakout rooms as you have, you can go into a breakout room, listen, participate in the conversation, and then pop out and go into another one, which I find very helpful because the students, especially if you do it randomly, they don't really know if you're going to pop in or pop out. So it, it tends to kind of be a little bit of a monitoring of keeping them on task. Um, but it also helps you hear what they're saying. Uh, a lot of times in our IVC courses, we have zero to maybe one or two students in our own classroom. So most of our classes are out in another location. Um, so, it, so we don't hear much of the conversation if we're not doing that. So if you, if you break out these groups into these small groups, you can either listen to one the whole time or bop into a couple. And then when you come back and you, you bring that discussion back, you have something to say because you heard what some of them were saying. So similar to like walking around the room if you were in a, in a regular classroom. Yes? Question, if you break them up into groups and they're sitting close next to each other, is there a lot of distraction where they're not paying attention to their group? and a lot of background noise, things like that with this? Is it uh, one of the things that we have to do is sometimes some of the students have to go to a different room or out in the hall. So, because we usually have a lot of students in Salt Lake in our classes, so there's usually eight to ten students in one place. So, um, I usually vary them. Sometimes I just vary them within each other and take one or two and put them in another group with someone else so that they rotate kind of through. Um, but usually it is easier if they have another place. Either they go to separate sides of the room or um, one, some will go in the hall, some will find a, one of the empty rooms. In the I also re suggest to students at the beginning of the semester that they uh, bring headphones and then they can just listen on their head, to their, their group on their headphones. But there is some background noise if there's more than one group yeah. in a room. So that is something that you have to think about. Yes, on the background. Yeah, so... Um, this is my first semester teaching here. I'm teaching in Price, and I have a readings class where I've got like three students in Logan and one in Brigham City. And you know, and, and, and for weeks where I have students reading different books, you know, I like to break them down and they do little pair shares where they share like, common things across what they read. You know, and and uh, I'm just wondering, like, like you know, I was really worried about being able to do that, and so I'm really interested in the Zoom stuff. What if students don't have laptops? So their computer banks and these. Most of the. Uh, 
I think most of the IVC students have access to a laptop, even if they don't own one of their own. The regional, the regional campuses have ones that they yeah, can you use. Can check out one from the yeah, and these tools also work on smartphones, so if they have a smartphone, they can do this. Any, yeah, anything that, that can have like Adobe Connect or Zoom, yeah. or they can, they can use on a device. Do students have to sign up for the Zoom, or is it how? With Zoom, uh, we, we set up like a classroom that has, an, and like Zoom has a, an identifier, and they right? just use that same link every week. Okay, so they go to the code, they yeah. get the web, as long as they get to the website. And CMA the was the same way. Uh, we put a link out on Canvas, so this is the link that you're going to use if you're group one, two, three, four, or whatever. Um, so there's ways that you can let them know. So you don't have to recreate it, you just create it one time and then they just reuse that same link. But it's helpful if you put that link, I have found, on the PowerPoint every week because they won't remember from the week before. So, you know, put that as a side in your slide or whatever. These are the links in case they need them. Yes? Question. Um, you, when you're listening in to the other groups, do you have your own headphones? Yes. Mm -hmm. me, when I do in IBCs, most students are with me. Yeah, I have my own headphones. Um, yeah, I bring my own headphones. And if to I class. was with a big group, I would probably go to the back or go to the side, uh, so that I'm not bothering them either. You want to go? Hmm? You want to go? Take that question. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to uh, create any trouble here or nothing, but uh, how does this requirement, or not the requirement, suggestion to have? a device to participate in this kind of this, uh, discussion or group work in class uh, relate to our requirements of uh, materials and books and everything that students need to have and we have to inform them ahead of time that they have to do it. Did, did you ever get into trouble because of that? We no. haven't. You just put it in your syllabus, you make it a part of your course so that people know if they sign up for that course they're going to need to have Certain these certain technology tools. Um, Do you have it in the syllabus or also? I have in it in any place yeah. that we advertise these courses. They know that they're going to need access. Yeah, and student and I've never run into a, a, a problem with students not having any kind of device. They usually have something or somebody else at their site does, and they can pair with that person. So never it hasn't really been a problem. And you know the tool itself. If they have a device, the tool itself is free. Yeah. They, don't, they, don't, they don't have to buy software. So the, this Zoom idea is a fantastic idea with a small I, never, <coughs> I teach a class every other year that's statewide. And we usually have about 60 students. So they're literally all over Utah. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried this with a group like that where you try I usually don't have. We do have them all over. So, for example, one of the classes that I used this with last semester, I had 16 sites. Oh, wow. and, but, but there was only 34 students, so that makes many of them were on their own. So, um, so it's challenging, but it's really good for those ones that are all by themselves because they actually get to talk to people. They are so excited yeah. <laughs> that they can actually talk to somebody and that they can um, make, build some relationships with some other students in the class. Our students kind of in the regional campuses go through as a cohort so they can get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so they might be really good friends with this person that they've never actually <laughs> seen face to face. But I've never had 60. One of the things to consider is how many you put in a group. Um, I would say five to six might be a maximum to put in a group. Just because if you've ever done like a meeting on Adobe Connect or any of the things that you might use to have online meetings, the more people you get on there, um, the more cumbersome it becomes and people still don't get a chance to talk. So just thinking about that optimum size that students can actually participate and, and not get, you know, not have a chance to. And so I typically teach via the traditional IVC. Do you guys do that and then have them do the These are all within class time. This is, dur this is, during, this is during IVC class meetings. Oh, okay. Yeah, these are not outside. Although yeah. you can do them outside too. Um, but we always do these in class. So, probably, probably the outside is people's schedules. Yeah, that would be yeah, it would be it would be a challenge. With, with this, are your groups and stuff predetermined? Have you designed it where the groups are split up? You have Her, yours are right. Eight, it, eight it, groups, and you know what students are going into each one before it starts. 
Well, it depends on the course. I mean, if I know that I have 20 students in a class and I want groups of four, then I'm going to have five groups. So I can look at who's on the roster and make those decisions. You're not doing it. I often do it. I, I do it first night. I usually do it first night of class. But it's set up beforehand. You're not setting it up, dividing up the class in class. <coughs> it's already pre I've I do it that way too. I've done it yeah. both ways. So in one of my classes, it's a writing instruction class. So they have a group. They have a reading group. So they meet with that same group every week. So when it's reading group time, they meet with the same group every week. So that's kind of set up beforehand. But, it, but I usually do it a second time, because our classes are normally two and a half hours. So I do this oftentimes twice. So, so that time, it's a set group. The next time, I vary it up. Because part of, part of my motivation, and it's probably the same with you, um, is one of the things that we teach in, in teacher education is devel developing a community of learners. And it's very difficult to develop a community of learners if they never have the chance to talk to each other. So, so part of the purpose of this is that letting them kind of randomly have discussions with other people in other places. And so they, by the end of the semester, they should have had several conversations with almost anyone um, in the class. And so they get to know each other better, know a little bit more. Um, they're a little more comfortable with each other. So, so groups are saved in Zoom, then you can save things like that, or is it something you have to Zoom, one of the things that's challenging. No, yeah, Zoom you is. have to, every time you have to put people. But what I do is I've got it all on a piece of paper, who's in what group, and then I know, okay, you, you go actually, here. Um, it, it takes a minute or two of your class time. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't take long. It's just, it's, it, yeah, I can put 20 people into five groups of four in less than a minute. So you start the meeting and then send invitations to these students? They are, most, of them, a, most of them come in, at least mine, come in and they, yeah. they know the link that we're going to use because so, we use it every week. So a lot of them will just sign on and just mute. So they're already there. Um, and then you, then you just create the rooms, move them into them and start them. And one, another nice thing about Zoom in particular, but others you can do this too, is um, with Zoom you can end. So, so I can end for everyone, and it'll send everybody a message. So you have 60 minutes, and it'll have a countdown, or 60 seconds, and it'll count down, and it'll, it'll cut them off. So if they weren't done, that's too bad. Everybody comes back at the same time. So, so. And it does have, it, it will let you just, it will randomly assign them if you don't. It will randomly assign yeah. too. Yeah, if it doesn't matter. You can do it, you can do it that Sometimes way. I don't make everyone do that either. So if I have a big group in Salt Lake, that I maybe have 10 in Salt Lake, and six someplace else. Sometimes I don't always make them do it. Sometimes I just vary them up within their site. So they don't always have to participate because they already have a group of people that they can kind of mix up with anyway. Um, but I usually take one or two of them and every time so that they still have the opportunity to talk to the others. But. So one of the things that um, helps us with having successful small group discussions is we have students prepare for those discussions by bringing something to class that they've done beforehand. So when we assign readings, our, our students uh, have to write uh, reading responses about that week's assigned readings. They bring it to class to discuss with their group and then um, after their small group discussions, each group will share out one important point from their discussion with the whole class in a whole class discussion. And I think the next slide has and what And usually we do for part responses. of our reader response has um, like this. It's uh, eight to 10 important points from the reading, from the chapter, or from the article, or whatever it is that we had them um, read. And then it has a so what part. So why is this important to you as a teacher, for us as a teacher, as a future teacher? And then now what, how can you apply this um, in your own teaching? And then they have to come up with a couple of questions. So they all bring one of these with them, so they've, and they know that they're going to have to participate in this discussion. And they also have to turn this in before class. So this, this reader response is turned in online, but then they also use it as a springboard for their discussions about what are, whatever it is the topic was that they had to read about. So that's one of the examples that we use it for is reading responses and talking about the readings. So I encourage my students when they break up in their small groups to discuss the questions that they came up with so that student questions then drive uh, the discussion that they have in their groups and then the discussion that we have as a class. And so when I, what, what I usually do, uh, when, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll usually set a timer for a set amount of time 
And when it's usually 10 minutes, and when it gets to the end of that time, I'll say to the whole class, all right, you got, you, you got to make sure that your group has appointed a um, spokesperson who will then um, open, you know, who will open up the discussion and by sharing one important point from that group's discussion with the whole class. I've also done it in another class. Okay. Right. I've also done it in another class where um, the students have to take turns being the discussion leader. So they're the person that has to come up with the questions to lead the discussion. So it's practice leading discussions. Um, and so in that case, I know who the discussion leaders are. I figure out who's going to go into their group, and they're the person that, that leads out. So you, you can vary this depending on you know, whatever it is that you're thinking of using it for. You, you um, another thing that I've used this for is a jigsaw. Has anyone heard of the jigsaw? It's, it's one of those where you don't necessarily have to have everyone read everything. So for example, in one of my classes, we talk about vocabulary instruction. And I have four different journal articles. Um, a, a quarter of the group reads one, a quarter reads another, a quarter reads another, a quarter reads another. So in this case, they do this discussion group twice. The first time they get together with everyone that read the same article that they did, take notes, they become the expert, and then we break and then they go and then they mix the group. So the second group would be one person from each other group. So it would be a one, two, a three, and a four. And so that person, for example, from group one, tells everybody about the main points from the first article. Two explains the second article. So they get the content and they get the gist of everything, of all of the four readings, but they only actually had to read one of them. <laughs> Students really like this because it saves a little bit of reading. They don't have to read everything. That just kind of explains the numbering. Another way that we use um, the small group work in our classes is to give peer feedback. And you could do this with any kind of project or assignment that you are doing in your class that you um, have students bring a draft of it to class and so that they can get feedback before they turn it in. You can do this with a variety of assignments, everything from research papers to essays to lab reports to lesson plans, our students uh, in education write, write lesson plans. Um, and th this is helpful for students as learners and as writers. Uh, we, you know, we know from the r research on writing instruction that writers need re readers, a community for praise, suggestions, feedback, and response. Um, so one of the things, we both teach a writing class and, and often have some kind of writing assignment that students have to turn in for us. Um, so some of, some of it is teaching them how to do peer feedback, because in writing instruction, that's one of the things we teach is that peer fe feedback is helpful for writers. So we have them give peer feedback on pieces of writing with each other or with a group. Um, so that's one of the ways that we do it. Um, uh, just any way, you, any way that you, you in your class can think of that you need, that it would be helpful for a person to have an assignment or a project and have someone to talk about it with. One of the things that I do in my in one of my classes is my students do a multi-genre digital inquiry project, and she did this in one of her classes too. It's a pretty big project. It's got lots of pieces to it. They actually have to create a website. It has to have different components. So it's a pretty um, intensive project. We spend about six weeks on it at the end, towards the end of the semester. Um, so just having them talk with another person about their ideas where they're at in the process, if they're having trouble. Um, that talking part just really tends to kind of like calm them down a little bit. And oftentimes I can pair them with someone who has maybe a similar topic so they can share resources, kind of um, have that chance to get some feedback. It's the similar kind of feedback that you would give them if they were talking to you, but it gives them the chance to talk to each other so everyone gets a chance to get some feedback from someone instead of it always having to be you. It, it all depends on how you want to do it. Uh, you could give students some guidance on how they want to do peer feedback. You can make it a grade. Um, it, it really just depends on, on however you want to do it. Um, one way that you could do it is you could have the students evaluate the feedback that they got from their peers. Or you could have a checklist. And uh, I know one way that I've done peer feedback, I actually did this when I was teaching um, high school was they had um, a whole list of, of 
questions that they had to respond to. Does the paper have this? Do you see this where it's supposed to be? And they had to respond to each of those electronically. And not only did it go to, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how I did this, but not only did it go to the student who wrote it, it also went to me. So I could give, I could give them a grade for doing their, their peer review. That's what I was wondering, actually, was how you went ahead. So you did it through electronic submission, not necessarily on through Canvas. But I assign mine, I assign mine based on topic. So, and mine varies. So this kind of peer feedback that we're talking about right here is something that you would have them do during class. Yeah. So, so they might have to like share a paper beforehand that they might have had to read before and then come together during class and have the actual conversation. But if you want to grade it, you could in Canvas, you could do it as a Canvas assignment where student gets a, one of their peers' papers they, or assignment or whatever it happens to be, they read it. They have to write some feedback, and then they could upload it to a Canvas assignment so that you could grade it. You could also do it on a discussion board. So there, yeah, but you definitely could do it in Canvas. Yeah. All right, so some of our tips on, on final tips on how to do this. Make sure the technology is working. And, and we will talk about that a little bit because uh, there is a new technology that USU is using this semester. Yeah, we'll, we'll, and we'll, we've had a little bit of issues in the past, so this yeah. is really important. You don't want your students to get really angry with you, because yeah. they do if they're having a lot of technology issues. And we usually start out doing this at the beginning of the semester, so the first time I do it usually is the first or the second class, and we just do technology. We just make sure that it works, that they can actually hear everything, see everything, so that if they have problems, you can send them to the IT number, and they can try and figure out what the problems are. Um, yeah, but, but if it's anything really major that goes on more than a couple of weeks, you got to be really careful yeah. about that. So, do all of us have um, access to Zoom? You have access to one called WebEx, um, okay. which is this one. We're, yeah, we're, <coughs> um, and Robbie Sproul, it's robbie.sproul at usu.edu, and so you're welcome to email him. <laughs> Hopefully, we told him so. we were going to tell you that, so. So he says that's okay. Because um, they were having trouble with CMA, and that's why we went off to Zoom. Our College of Education, if you're in the College of Education, College of Education has a license for Zoom. Um, so you might check with your college, too, and see if they have some kind of license that would work with something like this what to see if they have it. Have the, the great breakout I think, I, I, it, I think it does. Like I think it. I think it does have. It does have. It's supposed to have a way to do that. We've just found out about WebEx, so we haven't really had a chance to, to play with it a whole lot yet. Yeah, one of the tables in the Sunburst Lounge. Okay. Is demonstrating WebEx. It's Good. So with go to that and table <laughs> and find out for sure. Was, yep. When I asked him about breakouts, he said it was much more difficult. Yeah. We liked Zoom. Zoom is very easy. I mean, I don't want to be an advertiser for Zoom because WebEx is the one that they're using. Yeah. But we do have access to that through the college bed. Um, this mimics face-to-face -face classroom discussions. So for us, it works for our purpose because that's part of what we do in our, in our methods courses is model that kind of thing. It really helps your students that are by themselves that never have anyone to talk to. They really appreciate it. The large groups like Salt Lake and some of the ones they don't need it. They've already got these people to talk to, so they don't quite understand the purpose of it <laughs> because they have their little group. Um, but I usually make them at least participate occasionally anyway. They, they don't need it as much as the ones that are off by themselves. So one thing that we've noticed is that our, teacher, our teaching evaluations have gone up since we've started using this. And I know on my teaching evaluations, I've gotten several positive comments like thank you for letting us do these small group discussions we find them very helpful um, I've even had students make comments like I think one of the most important things in this semester was I got to learn from this other person who was in my group and you know just getting to know her, these other people was very helpful so part of our teaching philosophy at least mine is that I'm not I'm not the knowledgeable other sometimes <laughs> sometimes they can learn as much from each other as they can from me I mean, I know more than they do in some cases, but they have things yep. to contribute to. So having that chance to talk with each other is very helpful for them. So we makes them feel a part of the class. So we're out of time because we don't want to make you late for the most important meal of the day, dessert. <laughs> so thank you for coming, and uh, please feel free to email us if, uh, if there's any other questions that we can answer for you. Thank you. <laughs>